man, God is good all the time. It's a good reminder, amen? Right. If you got your Bibles, take them out and turn to 2 Chronicles. And uh, we're going to be looking at chapters 10, 11, and 12. Our main text there will be in uh, verse 12. But as we kick off, let's just go to 2 Chronicles chapter 10. And tonight's message is on probably a... Uh, relatively unknown figure in Old Testament history. And I say that because unless you've just read through your Bible, there's not a lot of stories about the reign of Rehoboam. Matter of fact, if I was just to do a trivia on who is Rehoboam, a lot of people, unless, like I say, you're a Bible student, would know that Rehoboam was the son of Solomon that succeeded him, that became king in the place of Solomon. Rehoboam goes down as really the first evil king of Judah. Now, some of you know we've been in 1 Kings. We've gone through 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 Kings. But really our intent was to just highlight, kind of chronologically, go through some of the Old Testament Bible stories or Bible figures. And Rehoboam really should not be skipped over. Rehoboam is very significant for a couple of reasons. And tonight we're going to look at Rehoboam. This morning I had Justin put this title up, Do Evil or Prepare? Because in Rehoboam's life we find that he's the king that gets, he goes down as, as having this indictment on his reign. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now he was Solomon's son. He had a very wise daddy. But as we saw in the last few messages, Solomon was far from perfect. As a matter of fact, Solomon did not end well his reign. He started well, but he didn't end well. And so tonight we're going to look at Rehoboam. And just uh, to make sure everybody's wide awake and in reverence of the word, stand as I read the text. I'm going to read 10, a few verses in chapter 10, and a few verses in chapter 11. We'll be looking at the life of Rehoboam. This is a cautionary tale. But I believe if we can isolate, look at a few elements of Rehoboam's epic fail, maybe we can avoid the same path. Amen? When we look at Old Testament passages as New Testament believers, we need to be reminded that Paul told the church at Corinth that things written aforetime are written for our examples. They're for our admonition. We can learn even from the mistakes of those in the Old Testament. And so let's look at 2 Chronicles and look with me at verse 12 of chapter 10. And I'll go back and cover a little more of this, but just so we get into this message the right way. It says, so Jeroboam, and by the way, that will be the future king of the ten tribes of Israel. 2 Chronicles 10, 12. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon there, on the third day, as the king bade saying, Come again to me on the third day. And the king answered them roughly. And King Rehoboam forsook the counsel of the old men and answered them after the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add thereto. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So the king hearkened not unto the people. For the cause was of God that the Lord might perform his word, which he spake by the hand of Ahijah the Shilonite, to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. And when all Israel saw that the king would not hearken unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? And we have none inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel. And now, David, see to thine own house. So all Israel went to their tents. But as for the children of Israel that dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then king Rehoboam sent Hadoram, that was over the tribute, and the children of Israel stoned him with stones that he died. But King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. And Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. Now look with me at verse, at chapter 11, verse 13. It says, I'm sorry, chapter 12, verse 13 of Second Chronicles. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem and reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah and Ammonitus, and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord 
Now the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemaiah the prophet and of Iddo, the seer concerning genealogies? And there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. Let's pray. Lord, we love you and praise you, God. We thank you for your word. And Lord, as we look at this young man, this uh, king of Israel, I pray that we would take application as we see even the mistakes that he made, God, that we would not do likewise, Lord, in this day and age. Lord, it's my prayer for my brothers and sisters in Christ that they be encouraged and edified. Lord, that we be challenged, convicted, if necessary, by your word. And Lord, that each of us would be better equipped for the work of the ministry. Lord, I pray that if someone here is not a believer, not saved, that your Holy Spirit would open their eyes to the truth of the gospel. Lord, that we can't save ourselves, that we're lost in need of a Savior. And God, I pray that by faith they would turn and confess you as Lord, profess you, Lord, and that you would do a work in their heart and that tonight would be the night of salvation if that's the need. And above all, we ask that you be exalted and glorified and we'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Now, I just tried to kind of highlight and hit some of the summary points in the life of Rehoboam. Now, somebody had asked me about the difference in Kings and Chronicles. When you get into the, uh, the history of Israel and Judah, Rehoboam is the king that effectively split the kingdom. <clears throat> now, the kingdom was not split because of Rehoboam. The Bible is clear that the kingdom was split because of Solomon's idolatry. God judged Solomon by having a prophet Ahijah anoint... Jeroboam, one of Solomon's servants, to be king over the ten tribes. And the word got out about this. And so what you have in, your old te- in the Old Testament is, if you just follow the book of Kings, you'll read First and Second Kings, really all the way to the carrying away into captivity, highlighting the kings of Israel. So it follows Jeroboam, and then it follows a lot of the wicked... By the way, not really ever a good king over the ten tribes. And they go in... Uh, to God's judgment first. But Judah, who which kept Jerusalem and the Ark of the Covenant and the Levites generally, uh, Judah and Benjamin, those two tribes stayed with the house of David. And because of Jerusalem, the, by and large, the tribe of Levite, the duty of the temple, was maintained under the house of David. And Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, pretty much highlights the reign of the kings of Judah. So you'll find passages in 1st and 2nd Kings and passages in the Chronicles that are contemporary one with another. You can read about kind of the Judah side of the history and also the Israel side of the history in case you weren't aware of that. I just we know I know we got some baby Christians and so that's why you can jump past the books of Kings and into Chronicles and find the same guy that you find in 1 Kings. Are y'all, y'all with me on that? So tonight, we want to just look at this passage. But because Chronicles seems to put a little bit better microscope or uh, magnifying glass on David's family, we find ourselves there tonight looking at the life of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the Bible says, chapter 12, verse 14, and he did evil. Rehoboam goes down as a bad guy, if I can just put it in those terms. My Bible has a guide to the kings of Judah in the back, and it has high points and low points, and Rehoboam is a low point. Rehoboam makes mistakes, and he experiences God's judgment. So what are the elements that we see in his life that we could avoid? Like if you could break down a bad story and learn from it, what would you do? Do you know that in most major um, tragedies, for example, in the fire service. Do you know that it's a very unpleasant job, but in many, many um, catastrophic events where you have firefighters die or you have uh, unsuccessful uh, attempts at rescues and things like that, not to point fingers at people, but just to learn and improve, they thoroughly break down what went wrong and what could be done better. And so in like manner, we, I feel like we are challenged by Scripture when we see these things happen in the Old Testament to see what kind of example, what kind of admonition we can take. I just want to start out with Rehoboam by saying this. His problems didn't start with him. Do you know that Rehoboam, in many ways, 
gets off on the wrong foot with the people. But the Bible says that the Lord was going to fulfill His word and take ten tribes from Him. He had already told Jeroboam and He had clearly already told Solomon that. See, Rehoboam's problems start out with problematic parents. Now, by the way, this point is aimed at parents, not kids, okay? Do you know, young people, the Bible says you're to honor your mom and dad, you're to respect your authorities and your elders, and God knew full well that nobody would have perfect ones when He said that. But let's be real honest, some of Rehoboam's problems start out with parental problems. He has issues in his home life. His dad was the cause of some direct consequence that he experienced. Because of Solomon's idolatry in 1 Kings 11, and that was where we kind of focused some of the last few messages, but in that we are told in 1 Kings that God was going to judge Solomon. God made it very clear to Solomon in chapter 11 verse 9. It says, And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Forasmuch as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. So, can I just say this? Before Rehoboam ever took the throne, he was not going to keep the kingdom intact. Because God had told Solomon, in the reign of your son, I'm taking some of the tribes away from him. And what's interesting to me is that when Solomon, who's credited with being the wisest man, not only was his heart taken away, but do you know when his heart was taken away, Solomon didn't even think right. Do you know when God gave the ten tribes to Jeroboam, Solomon did not accept God's word. The Bible says that Jeroboam was a faithful servant. Solomon was promoting him. And a prophet catches Jeroboam out and he tears his new raiment into twelve pieces and he gives him ten and he says... God's going to give ten tribes to you. This got out. Now, by the way, back then, there wasn't a Ross or a, a mall. Clothes were pretty valuable. I think if you had left in a new coat and you came back with your coat torn into 12 pieces, people would ask why. And it's clear that the word got out. And Jeroboam began to tell people, this prophet just told me I'm going to wind up being king over ten of the tribes of Israel. Do you know when Solomon heard this? Do you know instead of submitting to the word of God and saying... Yeah, I heard the same message. Do you know what he did? He tried to kill Jeroboam. He tried to kill Jeroboam. You may say, well, he was trying to protect his son's reign. Can I just say this? You ought to be careful that you don't fight against God. Amen. And, and do you know that the difference between Solomon and David? Do you know that when David was having his kingdom in rebellion usurp from him, he refused to take the same steps that Solomon seemed willing to take against the word of God. Let, let me just repeat that. David did not want Absalom killed, even though Absalom was trying to split the kingdom. And here Solomon was willing to kill Rehoboam. Listen, I'm simply saying that in the most important years of Rehoboam's life, his daddy wasn't doing right. And there was going to be consequence. Do you know that the Bible says in chapter 12, verse 13 of 2 Chronicles, we read this, that his mother was an Ammonitess. She was of the children of Ammon. The Ammonites were the ones that brought in the idol Milcom and the idol Molech. We talked about Molech worship. Do you know that it is the Ammonite wives that Solomon had that are specifically responsible for the most heinous actions ever taken place in Israel? Solomon built them a temple to their God, the abomination of the Ammonites, Molech. Rehoboam's mom was an Ammonite, an Ammonitess. She was a, if I could put it in these terms, she was a Gentile. She wasn't one of God's children. And listen, you may say, well, God's just being picky and he's, he's a xenophobe. He doesn't like people coming from uh, outside. Could I just point out that if you read the book of Ruth, you'll find that the Moabites, the Ammonites, they were both banned from coming into the congregation of God if they held on to their pagan identity. But do you know that when Ruth said, your God will be my God, and left behind the gods of Moab, 
Ruth got grafted right into true Israel. Listen, God's command to come out from among them and be separate, God's command to not be unequally yoked had nothing to do with your genealogy or ethnicity or skin color, if I could put it in those terms, had everything to do with the God you worship, the heart, of, the heart that you had. But the Bible is pretty clear that if Solomon's heart was drawn away and the Ammonite gods were worshipped, it's hard to imagine that his mother was not part of that problem. It says his mother was Naamah and Ammonitus. She may have not been the only one that drew Solomon's heart away, but she certainly was one. Now here's the odd thing about that. Do you know Solomon's crowning moment as he was inaugurated was the building, the finishing, completing of the temple, and then that worship service where the glory of God came down. And do you know he married women... For example, Rehoboam's mother, that Deuteronomy 23.3 forbid them. Deuteronomy 23.3 said, An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord even to the tenth generation. Now, Rehoboam was king of Israel. Rehoboam did get access to the temple. He actually, when he lost the treasures of the house of God shortly after he began to reign, he put shields of brass in place of the shields of gold that his dad had made. But isn't it odd that he had a conflicted home life? He had a mother that was pagan and a dad that had become a carnal. His dad had had a high point spiritually. He was wise above all the men. The Bible says above everybody else, but as he got older, he rejected his own wise advice and lived an ungodly, idolatrous lifestyle. Rehoboam had parental problems. But that's not really the main issue that Rehoboam had. Immediately when you read the story in 2 Chronicles 10, and by the way, the same account is given in 1 Kings, but we'll simply look here tonight at the Second Chronicles account in chapter 10. Look at what it says in Second Chronicles chapter 10. It says in verse 1, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for to Shechem were all Israel come to make him king. Solomon had died. Rehoboam's going to be the king over everybody. And it came to pass when Jeroboam the son of Nebat, who was in Egypt, whither he had fled from the presence of Solomon the king, heard it, that Jeroboam returned out of Egypt, and they sent and called him. So Jeroboam and all Israel came and spake to Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore ease thou somewhat the grievous servitude of thy father and his heavy yoke that he put upon us, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Come again, come again unto me after three days. And the people departed. Now can I just say this? At this point, he does dis display a little bit of wisdom. It says, And King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men that had stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, saying, What counsel give ye me to return answer to this people? Do you know, young people, listen, you can avoid a lot of heartache if you'll just slow down and ask some counsel. Slow down and read the instructions before you screw something up. Sometimes it's important to stop and get counsel. He said, What counsel give you me to return answer to this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou be kind to this people, and please them, and speak good words to them, they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel which the old men gave him, and took counsel with the young men that were brought up with him, and stood before him. And he said unto them, What advice give ye that we may return answer to this people? which have spoken to me, saying, Ease somewhat the yoke that thy father did put upon us. And the young men that were brought up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou answer the people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make it thou it somewhat lighter for us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than, th than my father's loins. For whereas my father put a heavy yoke upon you, I will put more to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Well, ain't that dandy. Rehoboam becomes a victim here of peer pressure. Do you know what peers are? Peers are generally contemporaries with us. They're people about the same age as us. The Bible says that he forsook the counsel of the old men. And can I just say this? Young people, once you forsake wise counsel, you can find counselors that will tell you stuff you want to hear. You can. You can find it. 
And the Bible, I think it's interesting that Solomon himself had written down this proverb, He that walketh with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. Here Rehoboam displays his own foolishness when instead of relying on the wisdom of years, he turns and listens to... It clearly says boys that were brought up with him. Here's the problem with your peers being kids brought up with you. They ain't no smarter than you are. Right? Blows my mind. Parents and grandparents that have lived a full life trying to give a teenager advice and they think that the five knuckleheads they run around with in the junior high building are smarter than their parents and grandparents. Right? And this is what happens really in Rehoboam. Listen, Proverbs 15, 14 says, The heart of him that hath understanding... Seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. Proverbs thirteen twenty says, He that walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools shall be destroyed. And here, Rehoboam is going to live that out for us. He asked his buddies. Let me just put it in that. He just asked his buddies. Hey, guys. The old guys told me something. They told me to be humble and kind and, you know, actually please the people. And I don't really like that at council. What do you guys think I should do? And then these knuckleheads go, oh, they're asking you for help. They're wanting relief of their burden. You tell them, your little finger's going to be thicker than your daddy's loins. That means I'll be twice the man my daddy was. And isn't this ignorant? He chastised you with whips. He said, I'll chastise you with scorpions. What does that even mean? <laughs> I, mean I mean, I'll be real honest. That's just dumb, right? But you know what? He almost repeats what they tell him verbatim. I mean, he's like, okay, y'all come back and let me tell you what I'm going to do. You think my daddy's tough? I'm going to be tougher. (laughs) What I wonder is this. He said, give me three days. I wonder if after his buddies, you know, what kind of counseling session that was where they just probably, they were probably sitting around playing Xbox saying, hey, this is what you need to do, man. You need to tell him. I mean, I'm just kidding. I know they were older than that. There was no Xbox. But you know what I see? I see a bunch of just punk teenagers. Yeah. Now, I know they, they were older than that, but the fact is they were raised up with him and they were clearly foolish. The Bible says the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. He spits out the same foolishness that they gave him. That's right. That's right. Daddy chastised you with whips. I'm going to chastise you with scorpions. And you know what they said? They said, that's it, we're gone. They left. Listen, Rehoboam, unfortunately, was a victim of peer pressure. Can I just say this? I believe that had he answered wisely, there would have probably been a much more beneficial way for him to rule. And I believe at some point Jeroboam would still clearly have gotten the ten tribes. But I don't believe he had to be this foolish. Yet the Bible says it was of the Lord that the ten tribes would go to Jeroboam. So he was a victim not just of parental problems, he was under peer pressure. And then something odd happens when the Israelites say, that's it, we're out of here, we don't have to... And they, listen, they act like they had just recently been underneath David. For 80 years the house of David had been king. 40 years David, 40 years Solomon. They said, we're out of here. We have nothing to do with David anymore. And It sounds like immediately to try to make amends, he sends the national tax collector guy. Like, you know, he was like, hey, they were coming because taxes were so burdensome to them. So what I'll do is I'll send the head of the IRS to bring them back home. So they just kill the guy. They just straight up murder the tax guy, the the Adoram, this guy that he sends to them. And at that point, he runs. But look at what verse 11, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, now, And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he gathered all the house of Judah and Benjamin, a hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against Israel. Do you know when they killed Adoram, when they stoned him, Rehoboam treated it like an act of war, of treason, and he gathered up a huge fighting force from Judah and Benjamin to go fight against the other ten 
But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel and Judah and Benjamin, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren. Return every man to his house, for this thing is done of me. And they obeyed the words of the Lord and returned from going against Jeroboam. Do you know that in the middle of this story, you see this interesting dynamic. If there are elements of his epic failure, his evil lifestyle, if there are some elements to be avoided, I think this should be noted. Rehoboam didn't always act completely evil. His life was marked by moments of partial repentance. What I'm saying is, Rehoboam had a very sporadic spirituality. He was stupid. He took bad advice. But then when Israel ran and he got together in the army together and the man of God says, no, don't do that, Rehoboam, he listened. And he said, okay, whatever God says, that's what we'll do. And he was acting really about as wise as you could ask someone to behave in that moment. In chapter 11, verse 22, it says, And Rehoboam made Abijah, the son of Mekah, the chief, that was his son, to be ruler among his brethren, for he thought to make him king. Look at verse 23 of chapter 11. And he, Rehoboam, dealt wisely and dispersed all his children throughout all the countries of Judah and Benjamin unto every fenced city, and he gave them victual in abundance, and he desired many wives. By the way, that was one of his daddy's problems. But do you know that it says he behaved wisely, and then he didn't. He was sporadic, spiritually speaking. He was on and off when it came to doing the right thing. He wasn't completely, entirely a reprobate. Matter of fact, his son Abijah, that he chose, goes down as a good king. Did you know that? I mean, he, he raised a good son. And by the way, by that time, compared to Israel and Jeroboam, he looked like a really good son. But the Bible makes it clear here that Rehoboam had a, a kind of a mixed bag when it came to his behavior. But do you know that in the text in chapter 12, his sporadic spirituality is really not the problem, it's really a symptom of the real problem. And can I just say this, the real problem in Rehoboam's life was not his parents and it wasn't peer pressure. The Bible tells us, and I love this, do you know, not very often does the Bible just sum everything up and explain the whole picture in one verse, but it does when it comes to Rehoboam. It tells us that Rehoboam, look at verse 14 of chapter 12, and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. So you say, why did he do evil? Somebody that knew him might have said, well, his mama was a crazy Ammonitis. That's not the reason he did evil. Do you know that you can do evil or you can do good regardless of who your mama is? You might say, well, he did evil because his dad was a terrible example. His dad was a bad example. But that's not the reason he did evil, the Bible says. With these strikes going against him, the problematic parents and his buddies being foolish, the truth is what the real cause of his demise, of his evil reign was, was this. It says, because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Why did Rehoboam do evil? Because he did not prepare his heart. He did evil because there was no personal preparation made to seek God. That's what the Bible says. He did not, and can I just say this when it comes to application? He did not, but you can. This thing that caused him to do evil is something that all of us have a similar responsibility with. Do you know that it was not just Old Testament kings that were commanded to seek God? They were. They were commanded to seek the Lord, but so are you. And isn't it interesting that it says he did evil because he looked at good and evil and he decided to pursue evil. That's not what it says. Can I just point this out based on this text? 
doing evil in the final analysis of you and I's life, whether you are a worker of iniquity, a doer of evil, it's not going to be because you necessarily chose to pursue evil. That indictment, he did evil, was the result of him not doing something else. Let me repeat that. His indictment that he did evil was caused not because of sins of commission, like he aggressively wanted to be evil. It was because he failed to do something. He omitted something that the Bible says is crucial. Here's my point. Doing evil in this day and age, just like back then, is the default mode that you will resort to unless you, as a child of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, seek God. If you don't seek God, if you don't seek God, you get evil. That's the way it works. Listen, we're in a fallen world. And he did evil because he did not seek God. And what scares me is this. That indicates to me that seeking God in this fallen world is going to be a challenge. It's not going to be easy. He failed to prepare his heart to seek God. Do you know that it may not have been in anybody's heart initially to seek God? The Bible makes it clear that none seek after God. But once God has illuminated your heart by the Word of God, once you're, by the way, and I'm speaking to Christians here tonight, once you are a child of God, you are commanded to follow Jesus. But in this fallen world, that doesn't happen by accident. It doesn't happen by accident. You have to make preparation. It has to become a heart decision. You have to get intentional or you will by default do wrong. You'll do wrong. Not everybody's evil looks the same. But make no mistake about it. If you reject the path of seeking God... I believe you cannot escape the wide road that leads to destruction. The Bible says it's a narrow road. Listen, he did not prepare. Prepare. It's a word that includes the idea of intent, of thought, forethought, of purpose, of plan. It's been said that no one plans to fail. They simply fail to plan. And that's what this says. It says that he did not Prepare his heart to seek God. To prepare your heart. How do you even do that? The heart, listen, biblically speaking, it speaks of the whole of us. It talks about kind of the epitome of our will and our emotions. The heart, it can include, listen, the mind, will, and emotions can be referred to scripturally as the heart. We're told to love the Lord our God with all of our heart. We're told to seek God with the whole heart. The heart is a a peculiar study when it comes to Scripture because the Bible is also clear that our heart is deceitful. Jeremiah 17, 9, your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Young people, do not follow your heart. Terrible advice. Just follow your heart. I don't care what Hallmark says. It's dumb to follow your heart. It's dumb. It's deceitful. Listen. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's deceitful above all things. It is not to be followed or trusted. Do you know what Proverbs 28, 26? Solomon said that you're not to trust your own heart. So then, what does this all mean? Listen, it's not that the heart, the emotions... Our, our volition, it's not that all of those things, once we are saved, it's not that all those things are, are, um, need to be, we, it's not like we can get rid of them, we need them, but they're not to be the engine, they're the caboose. Okay, let me, let me explain. You're to lead your heart. The Bible says you're to keep your heart with all diligence. You're to guard your heart. Jesus said you can direct and lead your heart. Where the treasure is, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, there will the heart be also. See, if I don't get intentional about what I am doing in life, then my heart will take me ever which way. 
Everything that catches my eye, every siren song that hits my ears will be begging my heart to go this way or that way. As a child of God, I need to choose that I will love God with all my heart. I need to choose that I will seek God with all my heart. I have to, listen, be enlightened by the Word of God and in my mind take captive the thoughts that would take me elsewhere and then I am to direct and lead my heart. Do you know that, um, listen, I am totally head over heels in love with Lauren. But I choose to be too. It's not one or the other, it's both. And do you know, we've been married almost 19 years. Can you believe that? Do you know, I, I need to choose to invest in her. I need to choose to spend time with her. I need, why? Because where my time and treasure and talents go, that's where my heart will go. Listen, it's, it's a very simple principle, and it's true. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You may say, well, the converse is true too, but Jesus didn't say it that way. Jesus didn't say, where your heart will be, there will your treasure be. By the way, that is true. Why did Jesus say it in the order that He said it in, though? Because can I tell you this? Since my heart is deceitful, and I can't really push it. Do you know there are some types of carts that you can't push because they're made to be pulled. Right? Have you ever tried to push? We had a little trailer that had a swiveling front axle. So I can back a trailer, but you can't back a trailer that has a swiveling front axle because it adds another joint in the chain. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? We had, a, we had a hay trailer that had a swiveling front axle. And it, it, it was a great trailer. It just simply was not meant to be pushed. Because when you attach the tongue that swiveled on your bumper and the tongue led to an axle that swiveled under the trailer, you could not back it. Because if you backed it straight for six feet, you better just stop because that's as good as you're going to get. It pulled great. Wasn't made to be pushed. Do you know that if you will lead your heart, your heart will follow? Jesus did not say, hey, everybody, where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. It is true. Do you know you can tell where your heart is? Just look at your... By the way, some of you don't have any time, day planners. You don't plan your schedule. You just let your schedule plan you. But if you'll, look, if you'll look back at where you spend your time, if you'll look at how you spend your money, I can tell you where your heart is. I mean, I mean, good and bad, I mean, you can see where your heart is. So, some, of you, uh, some of you grandparents, great-grandparents, you have spent your life on kids, grandkids. And that, can I tell you something? You love them. That's, that's not a bad thing. We are to, by the way, people are going to go to heaven, amen? But can I tell you something, you young people? Some of you love the world. You may say, oh, I don't feel like I do. Well, just check where your treasure's at. Where do you invest your time, your treasure? Jesus said you can direct your heart. Rehoboam did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. You may say, well, my heart's not really into seeking the Lord. That's why these phrases are the way they are. You have to prepare your heart. Do you know that I believe that you have to be intentional about falling in love with Jesus more and more every day? Because we, we walk by faith, not by sight. The more you get in the Word, the more you listen to things of the Lord, the more your heart goes towards the Lord, the more you should direct your heart to go towards the Lord. And if you don't, listen, by default, this world is not going to push you towards the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, prepare his heart. He did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. Do you know that the heart also in, in applied a singular internal focus? When it says the whole heart, do you know that loving Jesus and seeking Him should be kind of exclusive thing? It doesn't mean that you don't do anything else. I don't believe that the serving the Lord should be like a list. We're like, okay, I'm going to serve the Lord most, you know, first. And then I'm going to serve this thing second, this thing third, and this thing fourth. And then, listen... Jesus Christ should be the center. Your life should look like He is the hub and everything else spokes out away and is built on and connected to your walk with the Lord. He should touch every area of your life. 
In everything you do, you should bring him glory and honor. You have to have a heart, that heart of the matter, the inside of you should be desiring and wanting to seek the Lord. And if it's not, you ought to prepare it to do so. Prepare it to do so. You may say, well, okay, how do I get my heart prepared to do something that it doesn't naturally want to do? I know. I'm a marathoner. Do you know how many people enjoy marathoning? Nobody. Nobody does. I'm serious. I, I really have never met anybody that says, I love running 30 miles. I mean, the process is rewarding. The end is rewarding. And can I tell you something? Some of you say, well, praise God, Brother Clay. I'm never going to do that. And that's perfectly fine. You will get to heaven just fine if you don't ever run a marathon. But can I tell you something? There's lots of things people do that at one time they thought, I could never get into that. But they start, get, they start directing their thoughts and their time. And before long, what used to be a burden is no longer that burden. Now it's becoming more uh, a part of what you want to do. And what are we supposed to do? The Bible says we're to seek the Lord. He prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. I want to make application here as I'm wrapping this up. But do you know that if you're saved here, the Bible says that you have a duty to seek God. Deuteronomy 4.29 God told His people, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find Him, if thou seek with Him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Psalms 105 verse 4, Seek the Lord and His strength, seek His face evermore. Isaiah 55 6, Seek ye the Lord while He may be found, call ye upon Him while He is near. Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 says, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time... To seek the Lord till He come and rain righteousness upon you. And then God gives the same promise in the New Testament, both in Matthew, Sermon on the Mount, Luke's account, Luke 11, 10, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. Do you know what seek means? It means to hunt. Brother Jerry, how awesome would it be to hunt something that, that God says you're guaranteed to get it if you'll hunt it? Guaranteed. I mean, it's better than Keith Siebert's pay for hunting ranch because God guarantees that if you'll seek for me with all your heart, you'll find me. That's awesome. Do you know that God's not going to play hide and seek? If you will follow and seek God, He'll make His will known to you. He'll reveal Himself to you. The Bible says He will. That if you seek God, He'll be found of you. By the way, I believe that promise is good for anybody. Do you know, I, I've heard testimony. I believe that if a Mormon or a Muslim or a, uh, an atheist says, you know what, if there's a God, I'm going to seek truth and I'm going to seek God, I think they'll find Jesus. I do. God says, if you'll seek me, you'll be found. And listen, we are commanded to seek God. The kids play hide and go seek. You know what is really the worst? When you play hide and go seek with somebody who really doesn't like to seek. See, there's this fine balance. You want them to count to 100 to give you time to get a good spot. You don't want them cutting that 100 down to 20 so that you're not completely up in the tree by the time they come running around the house. But you also don't want them to just count to infinity either. How long have we been hiding? I don't think Daddy's looking for us. Right? By the way, great way to babysit for 10 minutes of quiet time. Just hide and seek. Where are the kids? I have no idea. <laughs> All right. How'd you get them to be quiet? It's a game. I mean, after a while, it's only fun if someone comes looking. Do you know the Bible says that God says, if you'll seek me, I'll be found. You need to seek God. Do you know many people never experience the things God wants them to experience just because they don't really care to? See, his greatest problem was not that he was antagonistic against God. Rehoboam does not present himself as somebody who is antagonistic against God. For example, like Jezebel and Ahab. Though, like, let's kill the prophets. No, he wasn't like that. But he did evil just the same. He wasn't antagonistic. He was apathetic. He just didn't seek God. It was not on his priority list. 
He did a lot of things. He, he, listen, he did some good things. He did some bad things. He goes down as an evil king and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Church, listen, I believe it's possible that our greatest regrets when we stand before God, it's not going to be because of the stuff that we did ill-advisedly, although there's definitely going to be an accounting given for what we do and say. But can I say very likely our greatest regrets will be for the things that we failed to do, that we could have done. Listen, one of the scariest verses that I read in the Bible when James says, you have not because you ask not. And I want wisdom to raise my kids. Okay, well, do you ask for it? Do, do, you, do, you, do you seek God? He's the source of it, by the way. And it says that he, he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. The Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Listen, Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, it's not just saying that you need to be spiritual. He was very specific that he was to seek the Lord, the Lord God. The God of the Bible. Where do you find the God of the Bible? You find Him in the Bible. I ask the inmates at prison this almost every week. How many of you would like to know your Bible better? And they all, Amen, brother! Then I get them. You fellas know your Bible as good as you want to. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's easy to say, Boy, I want to know my Bible better. But man, it's hard to get to know the Bible when I'm binge watching 25 different shows. Right? It's, listen, it's hard to know my Bible and keep current on all of my social media apps. Right? I, I, I consider great devotion time putting a like sign on a, on a verse set to a really pretty sunrise scene. Like, that's my devotion for the day. I just put a like sign on that. Can I tell you something? Some people don't find a walk with God because they absolutely aren't looking for it. They're not seeking God. And the Bible says that we can seek God. Can I just say this? I believe that we in the... Do you know that Paul says that, that Old Testament laws including... Listen, the Sabbath, the rest, Jesus is our rest. Do you know that when you entered into Christ, in a spiritual sense you entered into rest... But do you know the principle that you set aside a day to simply give God time and rest with Him? Listen, that was a command. You will. Do you know there were feasts that were commanded? I was reading through the Old Testament through Numbers and Deuteronomy. Listen, there's times when God said, this is the law and you're going to abide by it. Everybody's going to stop and have a three-day party. That they, he did some of these feasts. That's what he was saying. Everybody's going to get together, and it's just going to be a get together, like you know, family camp. Once, twice, three times a year, you're going to get together, and you're going to love God and spend time. You're going to rest from your labors. There were sabbaths that weren't just weekly. There were feasts that they were to observe. And I think the important fact is that God was building into their culture a time when they had opportunity to seek God. That's what he was doing. And I don't think many of us are very good at preparing our hearts to seek the Lord because it's, it's kind of foreign to us and it's a little bit abstract to, to, to kneel down. But can I tell you something? Especially as I've gotten older, a lot of times I'll, Lauren will get up and she'll be praying and I'll go into the living room and there's times when now, I, the other morning I went out and I took the Bible, the audio Bible, it's a little maroon thing called the Wonder Bible and I'm running with it and it's playing. And I caught my mind skipping. I was praying about some of our church folks. And I was praying about people. I was going down the road. And can I say something? 30, 40 minutes went by and I was still praying. There's times when Lauren and I will be by the bed and we're trying to pray. And there was a time, I'll say this as a, as a believer, where I thought a five minute prayer was eternal. And 10 minutes, like I've done said all the words I know after 10 minutes. <laughs> what do I do then? Can I tell you something? As you get invested in people and you start living real life and you start spending time talking to the Lord in prayer, before long, 30 minutes isn't enough time. And you, get, you start seeking God and seeking His face. And Rehoboam never did that. He, he never prepared his heart to seek the Lord. And therefore, he didn't seek the Lord. And therefore, he did evil. Evil was just default for not seeking God. 
It's kind of like when James said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. If you just hear the word when you're here, but then you go home and you make no plan. See, he did not prepare. I think God here is showing us that seeking God has to be intentional. That sometimes, can I just say this, sometimes it is spontaneous. When you get a call that your kids are in a wreck, no one has to tell you to pray. Amen? Listen, when you're going through the hardest times, nobody has to tell you to pray. But on those good days when things start going good, do you forget the Lord like Israel used to do? Or will you be willing to say, I'm going to continue to seek Him because I don't know what's coming down the road. I'm going to continue. And can I just say this? Following Jesus and seeking Him, it's, it's not... You know, once you begin to do it, it's not a big burden. It's a blessing. You know, before I got saved, and even after I got saved, there's times, there are, there is some styles of music that are really appeal to me, of my flesh. But do you know the days that, I, that I, I'm really close to the Lord, if I go into an establishment where some of the old songs that used to be my favorites are playing, it actually bird, grieves me. It doesn't, it's not like, ooh, I'm going to go out and find that station. It's actually like I get out and I'm like, whew. That wasn't glorifying to God. Why did I like that? Why would I like something that's telling me the opposite of what my Jesus would want me to do? You know, you begin to crave the things of the Lord, but you've got to, I believe, prepare to build that appetite for the things of the Lord. You know, I, I killed a deer this last year. I hadn't shot a buck in years, and can I be honest? I was happy I did it. But my heart's not in deer hunting the way it used to be. When Justin and I was young, we, we only had two seasons, deer season and preseason. Preseason started the day deer season ended. You just always were preparing. And you know what? You'd get your hearts on, on whatever you invested the most time in. What would happen if we began to diligently invest our time in seeking God? What, what kind of ministry, fruitful doors would God open for us if we would just say, you know what, I'm going to seek God and His kingdom. Matthew 6.33 says, if you'll seek God first and His righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. That's amazing. I want that. Amen? Don't be like Rehoboam. I close. Don't, don't fail in this area. Prepare your heart to seek the Lord. Hunt God and you'll find Him. You don't hunt God and you'll find evil by default. To know truth, you have to love truth. To, you, you, need to, you need to walk with Jesus. Can I say this? Showing up and hearing the Word of God preached, that's a way you can delight in the Lord and seek the Lord. But it's easy to be a hearer and then not do anything about it. Let's prepare our heart. Young people, in what ways could you tonight say, God, by your strength, I'm going to prepare to seek you. I'm going to prepare my heart tonight to seek you. Listen, the heart is deceitful. The heart will crave things that it don't need. It's like any other fleshly appetite. Do you know that I would be the healthiest guy alive if vegetables tasted like Snickers? <laughs> I, do you know I'm having to train myself to develop an appetite for good things. I want to be a good steward. I'm, I'm having to train myself. It's okay to prepare your heart. So you say, well, if I have to prepare my heart to seek God, then my heart's not in it. It can be. That's the point. You know, it may start by saying, God, my heart's a long ways from where it should be. Help my heart, God. Take your word and do its wor let it do its work on my heart. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, can I tell you something? Your flesh will tell you not to get saved. <laughs> Amen. Listen, if you're not saved, your flesh, the devil, doesn't want you to trust Christ. Confess Him as Lord. But if you're here and you're lost, the Word of God's been spoken tonight. The gospel is not complicated. Jesus Christ died for our sins, mine and yours, according to the Scripture. He, was, he died on the cross. He was buried and He rose again, according to the Scripture. You can call on His name. And he'll save you. I'm going to ask Miss Sarah to come to the piano. Grateful for Sarah and Jim, our missionaries being with us. Grateful she's serving here, playing the piano. Amen. Can I just ask you this? Are you, are you preparing your heart to seek God? I've heard it said, and it's an old poem. That we have but one life, and it'll soon be passed.
And only those things done for Christ for eternity are the things that will last. And I want my life to last. I don't want to go down with this epitaph that he failed to prepare his heart to seek God. And therefore, he did evil. Is it possible that our neglect of the best things may be a greater evil than if we were... Listen, when the Bible says, I'd rather you be cold or hot but not lukewarm... Do you know, can I be real honest? Most pastors would say, wait a minute, I'd settle for my folks just being mildly warm. But that's not what God says. God says, I'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. So let's seek God. Let's have a fervent desire for seeking God. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. you're here tonight and you're saved, could I just challenge you? Did you do a little personal inventory?